Wrap it on. <laughs> it's nice. Wrap it on. 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 Good morning and welcome to our edition of Rabbiting On. I'm Rabbi Debbie Young Summers and of course this morning I'm joined by my fabulous colleagues Rabbi Miriam Berger and Rabbi Robin Ashworth Steen. Good morning. 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 <laughs> so this week we are going to be having a think about Tisha B'Av, the ninth of the Hebrew month of Av, which is um really a time of mourning and lament and we're in a period called the three weeks leading up to that time when we are sort of getting ready for the festival we are in a period of mourning a period of lamenting um and i wanted to ask uh, miriam and robin what tisha b'av meant to them growing up because as reformed jews it's not necessarily a festival that has been massively important because we don't necessarily mourn the loss of the temple. Um, but I certainly remember as a kid, um, Tisha B'Av becoming more present as I was a teenager and services starting to be held at our synagogue. And I think the first time I fasted, I was actually on um, on Shemesh, on uh, RSY Nets the summer camp for, it was then called Stillin Bet, I don't know what it's called now, but it was the camping one. And um, there was like about four or five of us who got together and wanted to fast. And I think I was probably quite a pious teenager. Um, <laughs> but so what was, what was Tisha B'Av like for you, Miriam? So I don't really remember it until I was uh, on my year in Israel. And actually, um, it suddenly took on a whole real, very um, physical kind of nature, because we were down by the Kotel uh, on Tisha B'Av. And um, it sort of blew my mind. It was beautiful and amazing. And I I couldn't really, and not mine, I think is the way I can only describe it. Uh, I felt like I was watching somebody else's Judaism. Um, and possibly that's because um, Tisha B'Av wasn't really part of my Judaism growing up. And maybe that's also because it's always during the summer holidays. You just reminded me, Miriam, of uh, uh, a summer that I spent at uh, studying in Jerusalem as part of the Leo Beck program. And I went on to Shabbat to a, an egalitarian uh, minyan that was happening by the Western Wall, but not at the Western Wall. It was sort of at one of the southern walls where there's a, an egalitarian space. And um, as we were sitting there, you look around at the uh, ruins and I realized we were sitting in the shops that would have been outside the temple. Mm -hmm. There were these kind of shop stalls. And I was thinking, if the temple was rebuilt, I'd probably still be in the shops outside <laughs> rather than inside the temple. This is perfect. <laughs> How about you, Robin? Did you have a presence of Tisha B'Av growing up? You know, it's really interesting. I have a complete blank. I, 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 you know, I've been brought up in a completely reformed setting since I was a very small child. I don't have any childhood memories or any memories or experiences of Tisha B'Av, probably until I was a student rabbi, like a few years ago, and going to ceremonies um, at Miriam's shul um, all those years ago. Um, and then in our synagogue now, we have, you know, we, we mark it together. So no, I don't have any memories, apart from when I was at college, um, we did a course on Lamentations, on Eicha, um, with Rabbi Dr. Deborah Khan Harris, which was really powerful, and we held a really beautiful ceremony. And that's when I started to really come to grips with what lament was about and how beautiful and how powerful it can be um and how it can reflect us the, the the one time i had a really powerful connection to dish but i just forgotten about this actually until i started speaking was um with the arena bombing actually in manchester um and i was in finchley at the time i hadn't moved to man back to manchester yet um and Eicha was the one text that spoke to me the lamentations of the city my beloved city my daughter um, the inhabitants wailing and it was that text and I actually did a sermon at Finchley Reform when I was um, in my placement there about that text and that's the one time that I felt a connection to the text and to the festival and understood what lament could be which I think we're going to get into more but um, as a child probably didn't even know it existed really. That's so interesting. So I often think of this destruction of the temples and of course Tisha B'Av marks the destruction of both the first and second temples and has become um, 
about lots of different Jewish tragedies that are ascribed to have happened on the 9th of Av, from the expulsion from Spain to, I think, the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto, all sorts of different tragedies that were now said to have happened. It kind of focuses our grief into one time and space. We also have Yom HaShoah, but much more recently. Um, And that sense of having a time and space to visit that grief. Um, So although the destruction of the Second Temple was really the Holocaust of its day, out of it came a sort of redemption in, in rabbinic Judaism that was created to fill the void and to continue to ask the questions of how do we do our Judaism today without the Temple? And that, I mean, for me, is certainly the, the the rabbinic Jewish process is to endlessly ask that question in every generation. How do we do this now? What does this mean for us today? And that's what we are a, an authentic expression of in the modern world, that continual asking of the question, how do we do this now? What meaning do we add? So although the theme of Tisha B'Av is there, we're going to have an opportunity this week to think about grief life experiences and what it means to finish chapters to revisit our grief and to hold that um and I know that you both have lots of thoughts on these ideas um and and how do we hold our grief Jewishly and what does that give us the opportunity to do and I think that's part of my problem with Tisha B'Av and why I find it so difficult to connect with because when we think of grief we think of the sadness of what we've lost And I think for me, the challenge of Tisha B'Av is that what we don't want is to go back. You know, I'm kind of a bit in love with Luther Vandross's uh, Dance With My Father Again, um, which is like the song that makes me weep and wail. And um, I'm sure it has that effect on you, Debbie, too. Um, But that sense of, I think the reason it's so powerful is it connects that thing of so much of loss is craving a taste of the thing that we've lost Mm -hmm. and wanting just to to revisit it for a moment. And I think that's my problem with Tisha B'Av is we don't want to go back to, you know, the sacrificial cult and the temple times. Um, That isn't our Judaism and it isn't where we see the future of our Judaism. Um, So it's that piece of what does it mean to lament something that has enabled us to create the today without wanting to revisit what it was that enabled us to create the Judaism of today. I think for me, Robin actually summarized it quite well, that the the power of the text of Echa, of Lamentations, whether or not we would want to go back to having a temple, the human tragedy of what happened is so well recorded in, in Lamentations. It's that that the power of human loss and that's what we revisit throughout Jewish history um, although there's an interesting trend certainly when when services for Tisha B'Av started being introduced at Radlett Reform where I grew up um, they were quite explicit in trying to also bring in other human tragedies like Hiroshima or uh, you know other man-made human disasters where we had gone at each other and I was I'm, I'm trying to redesign really our Tisha B'Av service at um, EHRS and looking at these texts from around the world I'm not sure I connect to them now in this space of lament it's actually there is a need for us to visit that particular lament of Jewish loss even though we don't want to go back to a temple there's still that for me that human loss it's so interesting to me because I don't I think even now when when I mark Tisha B'Av I am not sure that even consciously I'm thinking about the destruction of the temples which of course it is and what I do tend to do and probably the spaces that I hold give space to lament more generally more personally and more collectively and it's only this year uh, with, the per- uh, with the student cancer, Rachel Weston, because we're working out a ceremony together. I've been questioning that and thinking, actually, is Tisha B'Av, a sp- I mean, it is a specific festival to remember specific times, or can it enable us to have a moment of lament, of just being able to connect with whatever grief we're holding, you know, from the last 18 months, um, 
the grief of the things that we've missed out on, um, the personal griefs you may have suffered. And can tissue bab hold that and should it actually? Because I think um, it's really important to have moments of being able just to let it go and release. Because Eicher, which is obviously the name of Lamentations, as we know, is how, but really is a howl. It's more of like a scream and a cry. Um, and I just, I, I know that I deeply need spaces where I can physically release. And, you know, it's something that I think is kind of denied to us as humans in this world of being able to express ourselves in that kind of way. And as women to like really express ourselves. Like I would love to go back to the day of like wailing women at funerals, like just really being able, I would love it because it, it does something, it releases it. So I, I like to ship it out because it gives me that space to do it. But I have to say consciously, for me, it's not about the destruction of the temples because that is, as, as Miriam said, that isn't a, a sense of grief for me. It's not how I see it now. It's interesting that both of you touched on uh, areas of, of um, moments uh, that seem to fit the, the model uh, with um, Hiroshima and with the Manchester Arena bombing. Um, that sense that comes up in of, of Sinat Khinam, like of that baseless, senseless hatred um, that is kind of at the at the root of this. Um, and that's so much, it feels like a really modern idea um, that, uh, that it feels like that sense that peoples can be destroyed, lives can be senselessly taken because of a hatred that humans seem to be able to live with against other humans. Um, and we see that, you know, we feel that that is a modern sensibility and it's clearly not. Yeah, I think that's so right. And actually in the last Shabbat service we had, we did a special themed service for remembering Srebrenica and the, the genocide there. And it, you know, always it's this week, it's the 4th to the 11th, I think, of July. And it always falls just before or around to Shabbat Av. And for me, they always feel in that world. And actually, I talked about Sinat Chinam. And I think that that's what I can connect to, right? I can connect to and feel deeply the pain of the world that we're in. That's really helpful for me, Miriam, actually, of, of being able to symbolically, in some, not even symbolically, but in a real way, connect to really what that stood for and just another tragedy, another human tragedy of a people. And actually that can help me com ironically connect more to the destruction of the temples if I can do th so through the lens of the things that I do feel more connected to, even though I don't want a temple sacrificial religion. Um, it's just that base layer of hatred and destruction, senseless, yeah. And it's interesting because there are lots of spaces where those different griefs sit now. So we have HMD in January, which for me is that time of reflecting on Srebrenica and Rwanda. And it's not only about the Jewish loss, it's about our ability as humans to commit these atrocities, whoever we are. Um, and then we have Yom HaShoah, which is that personal loss of something much more recent. Um and then I think the destruction of the temples were the Holocaust of their day. They were, you know, the Choban, the disaster. And in, I suppose there's a really interesting switch that might be happening as we sit as a generation that is beginning to lose the last survivor voices from the Shoah, from the Holocaust. What was it when the temple was destroyed? At what point did they start to realise we are the generation that's going to think through what this means and how we process this and how we recreate and rebirth and regenerate? Um, and, you know, it might be ours, it might be our children's generation, but we're beginning to become that generation that will move beyond a, you know, we must be Jewish because six million people were murdered for it. Um, you know, and I think we see that in the reform Siddur development, right? In the 1970s, our Siddur was full of pictures of those lost synagogues that were no longer, because that it was so present for the community. In the 2008 Siddur, those pictures are gone and our focus starts to shift. Um, and I suppose there's something really interesting I learned from Rabbi Frank Dabba Smith when I was doing a placement as a student where he gave a as, a, as a liberal rabbi, he gave a really powerful sermon about what we lost in the temple. Because it's not a natural instinct for us as progressive Jews to reflect on any positives from the temple. But actually, we lost this sense of drama and, uh, you know, 
a place where you could go and really be intimately close to the presence of the Shekhinah, of the female presence of God, and um, to acknowledge that there was loss in that too. But actually, when we look at the whole Jewish calendar, whether it's Yom HaShoah and Holocaust Memorial Day, which is a national piece, um, but also how the Jewish year is structured, like you were saying, Robin, we have these moments to connect with our grief and to have that release. Um, and for me, I think our grieving rituals are so powerful because they are about allowing us to feel those feels and have that release so that we can get on with living better. And actually, that's one of the things that we've lost over the last year in lots of ways, because we haven't been able to grieve in the way that we normally would. Um, and I suppose as we come out of all those COVID restrictions, still holding that grief that hasn't been able to be processed as it would have been is going to be really tricky. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think the power for me and what you've just said and, you know, the one thing I think we do incredibly well in Judaism is mourn. We're really good at mourning structures. And the one thing that, that always happens with um, Yard site, the yearly anniversary, um, Shiva, the seven days of coming together is it's all about you have to come back into community. It's all about, you know, here's, here's a time for you to mark your grief, like to, to hold it in some way. And you're going to be surrounded by friends and family, right? None of it is alone. None of it is meant to be experienced alone. You're meant to be able to hear people's voices, share stories, be together in that way. Um, and Tisha B'Av's the same. You're meant to come together and be surrounded by community. And I guess there's like an extra la layer of grief that that's in some ways not been possible physically at least. Um, and that's, you know, that goes to what we were saying earlier on about the different types of grief as well. Like the grief of what should have been in the last year, um, not about bereavement necessarily, but all those small moments of grief and being able to kind of have space for it as well. I, I think there's something around um legacy as well um that what does it mean to be able to um kind of take the box off the shelf of grief and say actually this is what i'm this is the memory box i'm looking into at the moment uh, and this is the time and the space that's been given to me um for me to be able to sort of indulge that sadness um but what's the legacy and how do we allow ourselves um, to be able to say, you know, our, our readings for um, before Kaddish, uh, I love the beauty of, of the idea that we uh, live our lives uh, in their memory in terms of being able to say we are the ones that are, that are still living um, and what does that mean and therefore what is our responsibility. Um, and I think that that goes well beyond any personal loss or any grief that is only associated with bereavement. I think every time we walk away from something, every time a, cha a, a chapter ends, whether it's the end of a career in a particular place uh, or the end of a relationship, there's something about um, when we establish and understand what its legacy is, what has it given me and how does it define my next chapter, it allows us to be so much freer, both with the pain of accepting that it's over but also with its, that, that it had its place and that it was in some way right, even if we've moved on from it. Mm, I think that's so powerful. And I think what I love about Tisha B'Av is it pauses in some ways before the question of legacy, right? So like I see the Elul coming up in Rosh Hashanah, which follows, is that time of them being able to talk about, is be able to think about how do, what do we do with this? Like, where am I and who am I and all of that stuff. Tisha B'Av is a moment to pause and just be in pain. Like it isn't, that isn't, it's a processing thing just to be in the pain. And so often in society, we're not allowed to be in that pain, right? And especially in the moments that you've just spoken about, um, chapters of ending, whatever that looks like, retirement or whatever, people always, this is my, my most hated phrase, will say, well, at least, you know, at least this didn't happen. It's not like someone's died, you know, don't worry, come on, get out and whatever it is. And that's so painful because it's a denial of the grief. And to be able to have a space to say, feel, be in the pain and it's through the, exactly, it's through the pain that you'll be able to renew a whole. It's kind of beautiful that our calendar has this period of mourning to Shabbat Av, and we go then into Elul and Rosh Hashanah and then back to Yom Kippur. We can't, comp we know that pain is intertwined the whole way through the calendar. But um, I think that can be a huge, like, spiritual, personal 
potential of transformation if we allow ourselves to be in it to experience it and not run away from it as well yeah I think there's the it's it's a very modern problem in a way that we actually not only don't talk about grief but we don't talk about death we don't prepare Mm -hmm. ourselves to have those conversations um and in a way I think it's the biggest gift that Judaism gives us is this space and time um to accept although there are holes in the traditional observance of grieving rituals where you know if you hit a festival it all stops or if you're a woman you don't say the Kaddish you know there there are parts of it that I think are taken away and the ability for us to say you know what okay the festival happened but you are still clearly holding this grief we're going to carry on with Shiva afterwards um and to adapt those pieces because they are so well designed and take away the flaws in a way that stop people from being able to really feel what they need to feel um and ultimately i really do think that is about allowing us to live better and that regeneration um and i suppose in a way tisha above this year comes at a fascinating time because it's the weekend before all the restrictions are taken away on the 19th where tisha above is the 17th 18th so that ability to think through what it is to regenerate together from this time of destruction and loss but also know that we actually we will have to do things differently going forward not everything goes back to how it was two years ago you know we, we're not rebuilding the temple of how society was and in a way it's a huge opportunity to reopen in a new way yeah I, I'm wondering if there's something slightly manipulative of the rabbis of our past um, not us. which not, not us, us. <laughs> but, but you i kind of feel like your your uh, analysis of, of kind of the restrictions being lifted is a is a beautiful one because it's almost as if what would happen if on all TV, you know, every national media channel um across the you know across the country the night before just played somber music and showed images of the people that had died during mm. um, the pandemic, right? Would we rush out the next day and party and say, oh, we can, you know, whip our masks off and, and, and rush into this new life? Or would we say, I'm still holding something of that memory of me? And I, I wonder if there's something about Tisha B'Av and Inter Elul that's there as well. That thing of, um, I'm going to just give you this time of mourning and remembering where you've come from when you start making choices about who you're going to be and how you're going to identify in the, in the year ahead. Um, so I, I think there is something about being kind of held, but also being directed a little bit um, of, of what we should hold on to when we new, make new beginnings. And Tisha B'Av isn't the only festival in Av. We often forget that only a few days after Tisha B'Av is Tu B'Av which is this sort of very niche, not very well known celebration of, we like to say today love. Actually, it was when kind of the women of Jerusalem used to dress in white and go out and dance and hope to find a partner who would pick her out from the crowd. It's Valentine's Um, Day, no? Right, it's become another (laughs) opportunity for Gary to forget to buy me flowers. And um, this sort of celebration of love within the Jewish community, the Valentine's piece, you know, people don't know we have our own Jewish Valentine's Day, but the fact that it's situated immediately after Tisha B'Av, I think, again, it's that reminder calendrically that we can't sit forever in the dark hole of grief and of lament. We need to also remember to move into life and, and into celebration. Um, although as you were talking um, about those other moments, I was remembering that this September we've got the 20th anniversary of 9 11. Mm. And again, it's another one of those anniversaries of when the world felt like it changed beyond the past, right? And nothing would ever be the same again. Um, and it falls on a Shabbat this year and trying to think through what it means to hold that grief that's still very real and present. Certainly for me, I don't, have either of you seen Come From Away? Oh, it's so not yet. This incredible musical um, about 9 11, which you wouldn't think could be a musical. But of course, it's this incredibly powerful story of a a little town in Newfoundland that a real story where 
28 something aeroplanes were grounded because American airspace was shut. And these 9,000 inhabitants of a tiny town welcomed 9,000 passengers and looked after them for five days. And as you watch it, you revisit all those emotions. I did. I revisited all of those emotions. I knew exactly where I was on 9-11 and what I felt and who I was with and the fear and the sense that nothing would ever be the same again. Um, And actually being able to go to the theatre and revisit that also feels quite ritualistically powerful. Just having that opportunity to laugh and weep in the same hour and a half show Mm -hmm. um, is really cathartic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key, isn't it, with all of this stuff and with the Jewish calendar that's so beautiful, is that all these emotions are tied together, right? You don't just grieve on one day and then the next day, you know, celebrate. It's all of it's woven. And what I'm really struck by in our conversation is the fine line, or not even a line, between fear and grief, that there is something about that we all, you know, all have a fear of death or grief in a broader sense that we hold on to. Um, And maybe that's because we don't, you know, I think as rabbis, we confront it in a different way, maybe in our personal lives as well. But, you know, that generally society, it's not something we do. So we kind of carry this fear. And 9-11 is a great, so even when you said 9-11, my body felt fearful because it was just terrifying that the world could change in such an instant. Um, And then you have love, which is the kind of, I don't know, the shadow side of grief. There's something about grief and love that are together. Like the greater the love, the greater the grief, right? There's something that it's all together. And I love that Judaism and ritual gives us permission to be with all of that and to hold it. Like the, you know, the breaking of the glass, which I talk about all the time as a symbol, because that is it. It's like fantastic that at the moment of the height of celebration, and that's obviously also about marking the destruction of the temple and more. We we layer on top of it all the tragedy <laughs> and like, you know, the world is still a broken place. So it's like specific, but it's general. And then even in that moment, we have to we have to recognize and know something's broken. And all of that's allowed. And that's what it is to be complicated human beings, isn't it? To hold it all, to live with the fear as well. And I think, I know for me, the more um, I can notice my fear and be in touch with that, and give space to it, the more that I can turn into love and compassion and all of that stuff. So um, I love the messiness and holding of all of those things and it not having to be in boxes, but we just have time to kind of ritualize and then step away and do something different. I think growing up, I've only just realized, thinking about this conversation, growing up, I think my father taught me that going to musicals was a really wonderful way to let yourself cry. I think the first time I saw him cry was in Evita and the second time was Les Mis. And, you know, we used to go to Blood Brothers probably once a year and have a proper good sob. And actually, I think there are lots of human ways that we find to contain those feelings of grief and loss that are not ours, right? I'm not grieving these t- twins that die at the end. You know, it's it's a disconnect to feeling a story um, that's not necessarily our personal story, but still allows that outlet. Do you guys have any sort of really odd rituals? Mine is going to the musicals. What do you do to process your grief? Maybe that's not a Jewish ritual. I'm just going to like put it out there and um know that it's awful and people will go and just know that i i eat through it you know <laughs> there's certain well, oh, i will do that too <laughs> that, but i know that there's moments um you know particularly i think um rabbinic moments when i've had to hold something that's been really hard mm. and i know it's not my sadness and i know it's not my grief but it you know when i, I i've kind of i need to be able to say as i walk away as I leave the cemetery as I you know whatever it is and um I know that it's not healthy that at that moment food is often the ritual that I turn to Mm. it's so often is food though isn't it around bereavement I've heard you know lots of people um a good friend of mine had to just bake after she lost her mum like it was just something physical and something creative and I often and this was someone said this at rabbinic school and it's something that I try and do is that if I've been with a family in a particularly you know, really hard bereavement. They're all hard, but you know, sometimes just the circumstances. Um, And I'll try and be with my son Gabriel or to go and like, you know, if there's something at synagogue with kids, it can be really helpful, that sense of, it's not really processing the grief, I guess, but it is about, for me, whenever I'm around grief, what 
sometimes it helps me to do is to turn into life more fully. Not always, because sometimes it's just too painful to do that straight away. But there is something that I find of like um, officiating at funerals, being around a lot of grief is that I'm able to just see the world in a different way and just be really super grateful for what I have, live life fully rather than going, sometimes that happens, but rather than going into like deep fear about what if as well. Um, but I think my my way of processing grief, I, I think a lot of it is not musical so much, but singing. I find singing like super helpful um, and like singing very loudly, crying through, you know, the songs that could be really helpful for me as a processing. So as we um, can't give out uh, tickets to musicals on this podcast, uh, <laughs> and as I'm not advocating uh, the unhealthy relationship with food option instead, um, I do feel that there's something that our Judaism gives us, which is the gift of acknowledging that we all have the box in which we put all of the difficult stuff mm. and actually being allowed and being prescribed those moments where, it's, where we're told, take the box off the shelf, allow yourself a little indulgence to open the box and wail and howl um you know if i could do um a uh, this is us kind of moment in the middle of a lake uh, and uh, in water and, and howling i would um another little subtle reference to the mikvah um but there's something about um i hope that the gift of this tisha b'av for those people who um like us kind of grew up for many years without really a connection to Tisha B'Av and with a real sense that this isn't our bit of Judaism, this isn't really for us, um, that perhaps after the crazy year that we have all lived, um, this is the year we're encouraging people to use Tisha B'Av to um, find their place, to um, take the box off the shelf and indulge themselves in a little bit of howling, whether they need to take themselves to a musical or whether they find um, the synagogue with the online or in-person uh, Tisha B'Av Tekes that they can um, turn up to. Uh, it's uh, sunset on the 17th of July into uh, the day of the 18th. Um, I hope that people will find their ability to um, lament. It doesn't have to be about the uh, destruction of the temple. It can be about whatever you need to lament this year. Um, please keep talking to us. Uh, we love um, all of the responses that we've been getting from um, our listeners. Uh, we love being able to uh, hear how you've connected with our uh, stories and our um, rabbiting on. So <laughs> make sure you contact us on media at rjuk.org uh, or um, tweet um, at the reform movement. So our next recording is going to fall right in the middle of when lots of our young people are actually on Jewish summer camps or events. My um, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so a little bit like uh, Shemesh uh, that uh, we grew up in in RSY Netza. Um, so we're going to be talking about the incredible power of youth movements and what they inspire people to go on to do, um, what skills they uh, give us, um, and maybe we will uh, have a laugh about some of the uh, more kooky memories of uh, of summer camps and uh, RSY Netza events. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing you all then and uh, we look forward to uh, rabbiting on very soon. Goodbye! Bye.